Golden Radio Hour. In just a moment, X minus one. But first, how does one man get himself into so many impossible situations? This is a question you'll probably ask yourself tomorrow night when you follow another hilarious adventure of Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Yes, Gildy's eye for the ladies and his impulsive temperament managed to entangle him in a web of riotous circumstances. Join the Romantic Water Commissioner, his neighbors, Judge Hooker, Mr. Peavy, and all the loyal Gildersleeve household as they romp through another episode of The Great Gildersleeve tomorrow night. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Cave of Night, by James E. Gunn. Oh, you want a little, Charlie? Okay. Uh, though yet of Hamlet our dear brothers, death the memory be... Anyway, how's it, okay? Okay. okay. Uh, check recording, will you? I may go over a half hour. Make sure they've got another reel of tape ready, okay? All right, uh... Look, Bill, I've just put the segments of tape together for the next week's show. I'm going to record my narrations, and we'll listen to it together tomorrow. I know this is unusual, but you're the producer, and I don't want you out on a limb that may be sawed off behind us. This week's show is uh, liable to either win us every award from the Peabody to the Pulitzer Prize, or maybe put the network out of business. Okay, we, uh, we start with a standard opening. Behind the world, etc. cetera, you know, 40 seconds. <clears throat> This is Harry Anders, your editor. At 8 o'clock, after the sun has set and the sky is darkening, look up. There's a man up there where no man has ever been. He is lost in the cave of night. And the fuel tank's empty. Receiver broken. Transmitting and clear. Anyone picking this up, anyone. This is Rev McMillan calling. Notify Goddard Rock, New Mexico. No way to get back. There's a man up there where no man has ever been. He is lost in the cave of night. We all know that phrase now, the cave of night. It was written by a poet disguised in the cynical hide of a newspaper rewrite man. But it stuck. It caught the world and held it like a butterfly pinned to a board. It started with a ham, an amateur radio operator, in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, all right, Eddie. Roll the first tape in here. It's marked. Am I too close? <clears throat> I, I was up in the attic. I usually have a talk with WG73. He's in Buenos Aires. We play chess. Well, uh, there was some kind of interference. And then all of a sudden, I heard this voice. Uh, I record most of my listening anyway, so I had the tape machine running. After I heard it, I called civil defense. Uh, that's what we're supposed to. If... Uh, look, Bill. I haven't done the final editing on these tapes, so don't worry if they're a little rough. Down out of the night, flung from the darkness, came these words, the first of so many that electrified the world. Notify Goddard Rock, New Mexico. No way to get back. No way to get back. I'm stuck up here. No way to get down. What does it take to catch the pity of the world? A man wedged underground in Kentucky. A little girl in the bottom of a well. Somebody alive, waiting for rescue. 
with the days of his life numbered. Somebody, somewhere, waiting for us to get him out. The story broke in this morning's papers. Orbiting 1,000 miles above our heads was a man, an officer of the United States Air Force in a fuelless spaceship. We're recording at the desk of Mike Bayless, senior night editor of the Continental Press National Wire. <clears throat> they always get a reaction like this. I remember the Floyd Collins story in the 20s. Fellow trapped in that cave in Kentucky, remember? Oh, sure. And the whole country hanging on to see if we could get out. Then there was that uh, little girl stuck in the well. Kathy Fiskus? Yeah. yeah. We pulled all those stories out and put them on the wire for background. But this hit bigger. We got the first lead from an Air Force handout in New Mexico. They just said an experimental rocket failed to return to base. But by that time, the cat was out of the bag. Ham operators picked up those messages from Boston to Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Mr. Bayless, you first used the phrase, the cave of night, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, you got to get a little purple on a thing like this. People eat it up. You can't spread it on too thick. Anyway... I was lost in a cave once when I was a kid in upstate New York. I waited around for a couple of hours in the dark until they came for me. It uh, kind of reminded me of that. It reminded the world of terrors at night, of struggling awake through nightmares. The fears of loneliness, darkness, falling, suffocation, thirst. It reminded me of Rev. McMillan. Perhaps I have an advantage over all the other reporters for newspapers and radio and television because I knew Rev. McMillan. I knew him in college and in the Air Force. I knew that he was testing rocket-powered craft at Goddard, but I didn't know they were so close to space. No one knew. Till those messages of desperation crackled down through the atmosphere. I remembered Rev. when I saw those headlines that morning. Straight black hair, Clark Gable ears, a reckless grin. He ate well reveled in expert jazz and Mozart opera, and he talked incessantly. His southern speech was no draw. There was too much to say. And now he was alone, and soon all that might be extinguished. The men from the radio newsrooms rushed to Goddard Rocket Base armed with miniature tape recorders. Gentlemen, I'm Colonel Arthur J. Hannigan, information officer for Goddard Rocket Base. And I'm authorized to issue the following statement. First Lieutenant Reverty L. McMillan, United States Air Force pilot, Experimental Rocket Division, took off from Goddard Base at 2234 Rocky Mountain Time. As craft, the XR-37 Mark II, a hydrazine nitric three-stage rocket. I'm sorry I can't describe it, boys, classified. Well, in order to maintain orbit, the motors were pulsed for one second every 15 seconds elapsed time. After three minutes, the exhaust was seen by ground spectroscope observation to flare for half a minute. As fuel supply is exhausted, the craft has reached sustaining orbital speed. Well, what does that mean, Colonel? He's out of gas. He can't get down. The first mobilization was of the scientific brains massed at Goddard. Few of them knew Rev. Brains at a research project are usually carefully sorted out and salted away from the distractions of the outside world. They designed, they invented, they calibrated and theorized. But they didn't know the short, stocky man with a lopsided grin who rode the fruit of their labor up and out and now circled the world of his birth with time ticking out. I covered the hearings in Washington for the network newsroom. I flew down from New York, and the stewardess came out every few minutes to tell the passengers the latest news. She called him Rev, although she never knew him, and once I thought I saw a tear. The hearing was before the subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, presiding Senator Alan J. Hagister of Kentucky. <coughs> All right, General Finch. You've made the technical situation fairly comprehensive, even to an old cane break, redneck hillbilly like myself. <laughs> I have tried to make the gravity of the situation apparent, sir. It appears to me, General, that the sacred life of a human being created in the image of his maker is in danger. 
is no light thing to be thrown away like some guinea pig. If that ship wasn't safe, if that poor man up there in the cave of night is to die, somebody is responsible. Isn't that right, General? Sir, a manned rocket was sent up because of one simple fact. It takes a computer of tremendous versatility and capacity to operate a Harrison Munch reactor engine. A computer of infinite complexity. And I ask you, General, I put the question to you, why was such a computer not designed? It has been designed, sir. It was designed a half a million years ago. There is only one mechanism competent to handle those controls, sir. That is the human brain. <clears throat> All right. I turn now to my second question, General, and I ask it not only for myself and my colleagues on this committee, but for 170 million Americans listening on the radio, watching on television. With that man up there living out his last days, why was it not possible to send a ship up after him? Why was there no second ship built? For one reason, Senator, money. The appropriation for rocket research fell short by 12% of the amount needed even to build one vessel. Oh, frankly, gentlemen, the deficiency was made up by cutting corners and diverting funds from other projects. That is not the point, General. There's a man up there who's going to die. With the limited funds you gave us, we've done what we set out to do. We've demonstrated that space flight is possible, that a space platform is feasible. If there is any inefficiency, if there is any blame for what has happened, it lies at the door of those who lack the confidence and the courage and ability of their countrymen to fight free of Earth to their greatest glory. Senator, how did you vote on that? <laughs> This is a special prayer service called by the Dean of the Cathedral for the safety of Lieutenant McMillan and for the success of the recently announced rescue plan. The church is filled. There's a sprinkling of high Navy, Army, and Air Force uniforms. I see General Finch in the second row, next to the Secretary of the Air Force and the newly appointed Under Secretary of Defense, Mr. Winokur. Prominently displayed in the center aisle, below the ornate railing separating the pews from the altar, is the small model of Macmillan's ship. One by one now, the congregation is filing past, dropping checks, bills. I saw one child drop in 12 pennies one by one. All contributions are to be used to defray the cost of the rescue effort. The congregation is now kneeling to pray. A moment of silent prayer will follow for the safety and rescue of Lieutenant Macmillan. One billion dollars was raised in one week from voluntary contributions. Another billion and a half was appropriated unanimously by Congress. The race began. Would the rescue party reach the ship in time? Of course, we didn't know then. And daily we listened to the voice of the man we hoped to buy back from death. Uh, now, look, Bill. On these Macmillan broadcast tapes, uh, don't let some... Some ignorant engineering vice president holler because it's not broadcast quality. Believe me, I knew Macmillan. There's more of that wild Texan in these tapes than in any, any hi-fi super frequency response studio recordings. Just listen. You, you'll see what I mean. I've been staring out the portholes. I never tire of it. Through the window at the right, I see a black velvet curtain with a strong light behind it. There are pinpoint holes in the the light shines through, not winking the way stars do, but steady. There's no air up here, that's the reason. My oxygen is holding out better than I expected. By my figures, it should last 27 days more. I shouldn't use so much of it talking all the time, but it's hard to stop. talking, I feel as if I was still in touch with the earth. Still one of you. Even though I am way up here. Too bad the receiver is broken, but if it had to be one or the other, I'm glad it was the transmitter that came through all right. There's only one of me. There are billions of you to talk to. 
You can't see me now. You'll have to wait hours for the dawn. I'll have mine in a few minutes. That's the way he talked. And as we listened to the lonely voice from the night, the engineers, the scientists, the construction men worked round the clock. General Finch presented the problem in the pool interview. I asked the questions for the combined networks that afternoon. Most of you heard the complete broadcast live as he briefed the world with the clipped laconic delivery of a soldier. There are two basic problems. We've recovered the first and second stages of the rocket. We've only to construct the third stage. The second problem is more difficult. The pilot. Lieutenant McMillan was the only man physically and psychologically qualified. We discovered that in our first program. His training and orientation took 18 months. We have now to duplicate this in 27 days. You think it's possible, General? I don't know. Uh, that's all, Mr. Anders. Uh, Stevenson, get me some coffee, will you? Black and some kind of sandwich, no butter, no mayonnaise. And then the voice from the cave asked a question and expected no answer. Do you hear me down there? Sometimes I wonder. I wish there was some way I could be sure you were hearing me. Just that one thing might keep me from going crazy. I was there the night we answered that question. I was there in a helicopter over Kansas City. This is Harry Anders speaking to you from a helicopter over Kansas City. There are 15 seconds till midnight. The plan was developed by General Finch. At precisely midnight, every light in the city will be out and then flashed on in two-second intervals. This will be the exact moment that McMillan's ship is calculated to pass overhead. It's, it's almost time now. Five, four, three, two, one. There they go. Off. On. Off. On. Off. On. I see it. I see it. Kansas City winking at me. Oh, yes, I can see it. Thanks. Thanks. You're listening. I know that now. I'm not alone. I'll never forget. I'm waiting for you. We're recording in the press gallery of the Goddard Rocket Base Main Construction Hangar. The vast third stage component stands before us, men swarming up and down the gantry cranes. The Mark III is being built to carry five men instead of one. The pilot selection has been kept a top secret to avoid unnecessary strain on the men selected. The latest progress report gives a possible margin of six hours between the launching of the rescue ship and the estimated exhaustion supply of oxygen to Lieutenant McMillan. Well, the shift is changing now. The expert construction workers recruited from across the country by the combined efforts of the Air Force Personnel Service, the Atomic Energy Commission, and the International United Electrical Workers and United Auto Workers of the AFL-CIO. The margin is six hours. Six hours between life and death for Lieutenant Reverdy L. McMillan. An hour ago, I saw the sun rise over Russia. Looks like any other land from here. The green where it should be green. Farther north, a, a sort of mud color. And then white where the snow is still deep. Up here, you wonder why we're so different when the land is the same. You think we're all the same children of the same mother planet. Who says we're different? <laughs> Oh, uh, can you hear me in the back? Hey, you stand a little close. Well, uh, how about this? Yeah, that's better. That's better. All right, gentlemen, I have exactly five minutes for the press conference. Therefore, I'm not going to answer any questions. Progress report is as follows. As a safety factor, we're constructing two complete three-stage rockets and six additional third-stage components. The telemetered reports from McMillan's ship have added important additional information and the first of the rescue vessels should be ready to be launched at the estimated time, weather permitting. Now, don't ask a question. Within certain limitations of air turbulence, the rocket will be ready to lift in time to save Lieutenant McMillan. 27 
21 days. The air is bad tonight. I can't seem to get a full breath. It seems to stick in the lungs. It doesn't matter, though. But I wish you could see what I've seen. The vast spreading universe around Earth like a bride in a soft veil. You'd know then that we belong out here. Come out, mankind. Come out and see what I have seen. This is Harry Anders at Goddard Rocket Base. The Harrison Munch reactor engine for the first third stage rescue is being tested here at Goddard. You can hear the roaring of the gases in the test chamber behind me. The work has been stepped up as a new calculation based on the increased temperature reading from Macmillan's ship indicates that the exhaustion time will be some six hours earlier than originally estimated. The margin of rescue will be in minutes. Very bad. Better hurry. Can't last much longer. It's silly, of course you'll hurry. But I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me. I've seen the stars clearly. But more than this, I've seen the earth. There where I have lived and loved. I have known it better than any man. And loved it better. And known its children better. I have a better tomb than the greatest conqueror Earth ever bore. Do not disturb. Count down for blast off. Five, four, three, two, one. Anders, tape 323. We're in the press operation room of Goddard Field. The rescue rocket has been aloft 53 minutes plus. Its calculated time of arrival is 54 minutes. You will hear the voice of General Beauregard Finch on a direct pickup from the rescue vessel, which has been named unofficially the Lifesaver. Silent crowds have collected at the outer perimeter of the rocket base, as if by their presence they might help it. Come, quiet, quiet. The next voice you hear will be General Finch, aloft in the rescue ship. The voice quality may not be good. He's speaking over a throat mic in his pressure suit. Mark three to base. This is Finch. Come to secure that cable. We have just secured to the airlock of Macmillan's ship. I'm now entering the lock. The inner door is closed. I have closed the outer door. The inner door is cycling. Now it is open. Bring in those oxy bottles, will you? The bulkhead to the control room is open. Is he all right? Come on, will you? What's happening? Lieutenant McMillan is dead. He died heroically, waiting till all hope was gone until every oxygen gauge stood at zero. And then, well, the airlock was open when we arrived. In accordance with his own wish, his body will be left here in its eternal orbit. I'm going to leave now. My feet will be the last to touch this deck. Lieutenant McMillan is in his control chair, staring out towards the stars. I'll leave the airlock doors open behind me. Let the airless, frigid arms of space protect and preserve for all eternity. This man they would not let go. Well, that's the show, Bill. Bill, you remember at the conference we we hadn't made up our mind whether to pick anything up from the celebration last night after the news of the Mars landing? I said it was the right end for Rev. McMillan's story. You said it was old stuff. Every kid knew the sequence. The ships built to rescue Rev used to set up the satellite base from the base to the moon and now to Mars. Well, I went out with a mini-tape last night, and I've got the end of the story. Here it is. 
This is Harry Anders in Times Square. The neon rocket ship at the top of the Times building has just flashed into brilliant light. The signal that the landing signal has been received from the rocket Rev. McMillan III. Man has landed on Mars. And a holiday crowd here in Times Square is celebrating like a thousand New Year's rolled into one. I'm being, I'm being tossed and pushed and clapped on the back all at once. Uh, let's see what the man on the street thinks about man on Mars. Uh, you, uh, you, sir, uh, I'm broadcasting. No, no. No, uh, how do you feel about it, sir? How do you feel tonight about man's conquest of space, of the planet? Leave me alone. I'm in a hurry. Uh, just a few words of the... Look, you get your hands off me. Let go of me. I'm not in... Wait, wait a minute, sir. Wait, wait. Wait. Rev! Rev, come back here. Rev! Do you think I could listen to that voice over and over in a tape editing room and not know every vowel, every consonant? I'm telling you, Bill, I saw him. Rev McMillan. The black hair was gray and those Clark Abel ears were pinned back, but that's a simple operation. I played that piece of tape over and over. It was Rev. I know it. He isn't up there. He's alive. We've got it, Bill. We've got it on our show. We'll break it. Rev McMillan is alive. I haven't written it yet, but we finish it off with this, with a question. Why did they announce he was dead? I'm in the tape editing room now. I've got the reel ready to record the answer. Excuse me, Mr. Anders. I'm... Uh, hey, 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 J just a minute. I'm recording. You better see the page outside uh, of the... Mr. Anders, I'd like to talk to you for a moment, if I may. I have a letter of authorization. Oh, uh, no, just a minute. I'll, I'll be through in a minute. Look, Bill, I've got the answer now. Last night, they landed on Mars. But that first ship, the one that circles up there now, there isn't anybody on it. There never was, except a 30 days recording and a transmitter. That's all. He was never up there. They didn't have the money for a manned rocket. They wanted a crash program all out, so they sent a decoy up. <laughs> and we all broke our hearts to rescue the man who wasn't there. Oh, he must be laughing, General Finch and the rest of them, the ones that knew. You know, I guess they had a problem. What to do with Rev? <laughs> I wonder if he slipped away from whatever guards they have around him to see the celebration. He looked a little, uh, a little sad. I think sometimes he, he must wish he was really up there in the cave of night, seated in the icy control room, 1,075 miles above the earth, staring out at the stars. Mr. Anders, I must insist... What? That... Uh, oh, uh... Oh, Bill. Looks as if I won't have to worry about editing this tape. My friends are from Washington. I'd like to call your attention to the last paragraph. What? Oh, no, 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 no. It's very simple. You won't have to burn it. It's easy to destroy recording tape. I throw this switch. When the tape goes through, the erasing head, it's, it's gone forever. Oh, too bad. Would have made one fine show. Okay. So long, Rev. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features an exciting serial, Slave Ship, by Frederick Pohl. In just a moment, X-1. But first, there's a certain water commissioner whose interest in the ladies sometimes overshadows his interest in civic affairs. His name is a familiar one, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, and he'll pursue his adventures tomorrow night when NBC Radio presents another comic episode of The Great Gildersleeve. So when you hear the familiar voice and hearty laugh of the water commissioner from Summerfield tomorrow, why, stay tuned and enjoy another romantic scramble with the one and only The Great Gildersleeve on this NBC station. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. <laughs> Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X, 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 X minus, 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 min
One. Tonight's story, The Sea Shoot, by Isaac Asimov. We were on our way home to Earth when it happened. Six of us coming home as passengers aboard the merchant spaceship Starfire. At the start of the Second Interstellar War, the one between Earth and the planet Chloro. And then it happened. Now hear this. Condition red. Condition red. We are under attack from a Chloran battle cruiser. All hands forward to battle stations. Passengers will remain confined to the after cabin. Condition red. We are being attacked. The interception by the Chloran cruiser, the murderous running jewel of energy blasts and force field defenses. We huddled in the passengers' after cabin, terrified, not knowing how the battle was going. We could hear the desperate bursts of steam through the steering tubes as the Starfire maneuvered to dodge the enemy attacks. And then... Now what? Uh, the beginning of the end, you might call it. Well, what does it mean, Stuart? You were a space pilot? It means our generators have been drained of energy. We can't fight back. But, Monsieur, All right, don't we... worry. They won't destroy us. They need our ship too badly. They'll simply board us and take over. But what about the crew? The crew, Colonel? If they have any sense, they'll surrender. If they choose to fight, they'll... Now, they're coming aboard. Now, be very still. Oh, Mother in heaven, help Would us. You be still. If only those fools on deck will surrender without a struggle. They are fighting. Yes, it's the end. we got to help them. All right, don't open that door. We just can't let them die. You can't help them. I'm going. I don't... Stop him. Ah! All right. Anesthesia. Shut the door quickly. Anesthesia. My brother. That poor fool. I'll get them. My brother, I swear to you, I'll get them. Yeah, you better cover his body. The brutes. The monstrous, green-skinned brutes. They're no more brutes than we are, Colonel. This is a war. Are you defending them? I'm merely pointing out the facts. I ought to strangle you. Why not save it for the chloros? I will. I promise you I will. Well, they're probably deciding right now what to do with us. We might as well settle down and wait. We sat there, the five of us and listened while the Chloran invaders killed off the members of the Starfire's crew. Among us was Colonel Anthony Wyndham, an old Colonel Blimp type with a lame leg. Wyndham had spent his life in the militia back on Earth, but had never seen a battle. There was Demetrius Polyarchitis, who had just watched his brother being killed by a chlorocarbonizer. Polly was a huge man. He and his brother had tried truck farming in Arcturus and given it up after two seasons. Then there was LeBlanc, a sensitive, frightened young man of 22, and Randolph Mullen, who looked like somebody's caricature of a bookkeeper, a mild, balding, milk-toast little man. And there was myself, John Stewart. I was the only one who'd ever had contact with the chloro people. I had a pair of artoplasm hands to prove it. It is quiet now. Yeah, they've finished with the crew. Mr. Stewart? Yes, Mr. Mullen. What do you think will happen next? Well, they'll put a prize crew of two aboard and take us to one of their home planets as prisoners of war. Only two of the Chloros will stay aboard? Well, two is all they'll need. <laughs> Why, Colonel? You're thinking of leading a gallant raid to retake the ship? Well, simply a point of information, Dasher. All right, then let me give you another point of information. If you want to commit suicide quick, just open that bulkhead door. Three steps inside, you'd fall on your face. But why? Don't you smell anything, LeBlanc? Get close to the door. It smells like gas. Yeah, it is gas. Chlorine gas. They breathe it like we breathe oxygen. They've chlorinated the whole cruise compartment. One big whiff of that and we'd all be dead. So just forget about rushing the chloros. How do you know so much about their habits, Stuart? I lived on a chloro planet for six months. You see these hands? They were mangled in the oxygenating machinery of my own quarters. They grew these... Artoplasm things and operated. 
They're weak, but at least I have hands again. Monsieur Stewart. Yeah. Will they? Will they kill us? No. Why do you say that? Because in their own way, they're gentlemen. Probably we'll be interned for the duration. You call them gentlemen? After they kill my brother in cold blood, you call them gentlemen? You know, Stuart, you sound more and more like a blasted greenie sympathizer. Blasted, man. Where's your patriotism and loyalty? My loyalty is where it belongs, with honesty and decency, regardless of the shape of the being it appears in. This is a ridiculous war. Why are we fighting these people? We can live only on planets with oxygen, and oxygen is poison to them. They can live only in chlorine atmosphere, which is deadly to us. Yet we're fighting them over a bunch of worthless asteroids that neither of us can live on comfortably. Well, it's it's a matter of principle. It's a matter of stupid pride and greed. I don't like what you say, mister. Why not? Because you talk too nice about these greeny scum. They're good to you, eh? Well, they weren't good to my brother. They killed him. And I think maybe I'll kill you, you rotten oh, greenies. Holy shit! Mullen, uh, grab him. Uh, I can't break his hold. Uh, uh, they are coming in. Holy, let him go. They saved your life this time. But when I'm finished with them... Quiet, quiet. I think they're opening the lock. So don't get between us. Holy, don't lose your head. They'll kill us all. The chloro was not a pleasant sight to anyone unused to him. He was about the height of an Earthman, but the top of him was just a green stalk with eyes. He was still wearing a space suit to protect him from the oxygen in our compartment. In one of his tendrils, he carried a chloran gun. As he stood in the doorway, I could see Polyarchita's eyes begin to glisten with rage. Then, with a bellow like a huge bull, he threw himself at the chloro. not dead, merely temporarily paralyzed. You five will remain together as prisoners of war. We expect to reach our own planet within several weeks, your time. There you will be interned for the duration of the war. If any of you attempts to leave this compartment, we shall be forced to destroy you. That is all I have to communicate. Hadn't we better do something for Mr. Polly Arkady? Oh, he'll be all right. Just hoist him up in the cot. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Hi, right, Polly. Can you hear me, you stupid brute? His voice is coming back. Yeah. Now, I know what's going on in that thick skull of yours, Polly. You think that when the paralysis wears off, you'll ease your feelings by slamming me around some more. Well, if you do, it'll be curtains for all of us. How do you mean, sir? None of you know the chloros the way I do. Unlike us, they assume automatically that any group of Earthmen they find together comprises a biological grouping, like an ant colony. The result is that they consider the group as something, well, something holy. Now, they'd never break us up. And if one of us did any harm to another, they'd have us all executed as a bunch of chlorotype perverts, a non-functioning group. So call all the names you want. But keep your hands to yourself or we're finished. My little speech had a sobering effect on the group. For the next 24 hours, we did little besides eat our rations and think. I tried to evaluate them. The colonel I had figured for an old windbag. Polyarchitis was a hate-filled brute. LeBlanc would crack first. It was like a frightened child. Mullen? Mullen was a non-entity. A mouse instead of a man. Everything he did seemed prissyish. His voice had the quality of furtively rustling underbrush. How long did you say the trip would take, Mr. Stewart? Well, the chloro said about two weeks. Gentlemen, uh, if I may interrupt. Colonel? Now, it has occurred to me that perhaps you know of some... Some weakness that might enable us to overcome these chloros. The only weakness they've got is that they can't stand oxygen. Oh, but there must be some way to get the best of the man. After all, there are only two. Look, before I answer, 
Colonel, I have to know your motive. Is it to save your own skin or help Earth win the war? Oh, dash it, man, to help our side, of course. What we're looking for is the way to save the ship for Earth without losing our lives, yes? Well, all right, let's take a vote, then. LeBlanc? I... I have a wife waiting on Earth, Mr. Stewart. I do not want to die. Uh Uh-huh. Hero number one. What about you, Mullen? I don't see how we could accomplish it without... Uh Hero number two. Well, Paul Yakitis. When I kill Glorus, it will be with my bare hands. On their planet, I will kill dozens, I promise you. Uh Uh-huh. Three down. Well, Colonel, don't you want to march to glory, an old militia man like you? Your attitude is very cynical and unbecoming, Stuart. I see. Well, then I'll have to blow the ship up myself. Stuart! Don't worry, Colonel. I don't intend to be a dead hero. Of course, there is a way we might do it. What did you say, Mr. Mullen? There's a spacesuit and magnetic boots stored in that locker over there. We might be able to reach the control room from the outside of the ship. The outside? But how would we get outside? Well, this compartment has a sea chute. It must. Uh, what is a, a, a sea chute? A sea chute, my boy, is a casualty chute. It doesn't get talked about much, but all the main compartments have them. They're just little airlocks down which you slide a corpse. Burial in space. Oh, blast it, Mullen. Uh, suppose you did get outside. How could you re-enter the ship? Uh, through the steam tubes, the ones they use to guide the ship. Wait a minute, Mullen. What do you know about steam tubes? I thought you were a bookkeeper. Well, on Arcturus, I got interested in spaceship models. I, I studied all about them. On my own time, of course. Yeah, yeah, naturally. At, at any rate, I learned that the steam tubes have an access vent directly to the control room for repairs and, and so forth. And the claws, they are in the control room. Uh, what do you think, Stuart? Well, it's a video sort of idea, but it might just work. We could get permission from the Cloros to open the sea chute and bury Paulie's brother. And one of us could slip into it, work forward, and climb up through the steam tube. The question being, which one? What about you? You with your loud talk and your sneers. I'm no hero, Polly. I've already said that. My object is to stay alive. If the steam tube let go while you were in it, you'd be broiled like a lobster. Now, how about the colonel here? If I were younger, blasted, I'd trounce you. You know very well with my injured leg. Yeah, of course. Not to mention my artificial hands. Well, now, what unfortunate deformities do the rest of us have? Polly? You just keep talking, Mr. Big Mouth, and pretty soon we'll kick your teeth in. Of course, that's your standard reply to everything, isn't it? LeBlanc, will you do it? I... I cannot. Not even to get back to Denise? Please, I I cannot... LeBlanc needn't go. I'll do it. What? After all, it is my idea. Wait a minute. Are you serious, Mullen? Yes. Well, how... I don't understand. Why? Why you? Well, it... It seems no one else will do it. But that's no reason, man. I can't think of any other. Uh, Look here. Do you really intend to go through with it, sir? Yes, I suppose I do. Well, dash it, man. Let me shake your hand. You, you're you're an Earthman, by heaven. You do this thing and win or die. I'll bear witness for you. It was quite a moment. Mullen the mouse had suddenly turned into a man. He just stood there awkwardly while the colonel pupped his hand. Paul Yakita seemed stunned. LeBlanc was wide-eyed. And I? Well, I was in a peculiar position, one in which I rarely found myself. I had absolutely nothing to say. That ought to bring them. I hear one. What is it, Earthman? One member of our unit is dead, as you know. We request permission to jettison his body out of the casualty chute. You may do so. You'll have to open the chute lock from the control room. I will do so. Is there anything else? No. Nothing else. Thank you. Oh, boy. All right, come on now. We'll have to work fast. Mulling, get into a space suit from the emergency locker. Polly, help Mom with those magnetic boots. How are you? I'm working as fast as I can. The arm. There. All right, give me the helmet. The helmet. Okay. Now, Mulling, 
Better scratch your nose if you have to. It's your last chance for a while. What about radio contact? You can talk to us. We'll listen in on the helmet set in one of the other suits. The chloros won't have their set on the interphone frequency. Wait a moment. What for? Dash it, what's he going to use for a weapon? He isn't big enough to fight them barehanded. Oh, no, that's true. Well, how about one of those oxygen cylinders? Good idea. Use it to bash them over the head. Now, give him one of the cylinders equipped with a reducing valve. Now, look, Mullen, if your magnetic boots fail and you start drifting away into space, open this valve. Mm-hmm. See that? Now, you can use it like a miniature jet and try to blow yourself back to the ship. Understand? Uh, I think so. Well, I only hope it works. All right, here goes the helmet. You'd better hurry. The light is on over the sea chute. Yeah. All right. That means they've opened the lock. Here. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Oh, oh, oh. LeBlanc, give me that other space helmet. Yes, here. Let me switch on the radio. Can you hear me, Mullen? I hear you. Fine. Plenty of air? Air's okay. Uh-huh. Polly, open the sea chute. Okay, now help him in. Are you ready? Ready. Well, good luck. Close the chute. Pull the ejector valve. Now. He's out. Oh, God help him. The light is out. Yeah. The chloros have closed the chute lock. I... I don't suppose he has much of a chance. No. Do you think... Uh, do you think he knew it? I don't know. I just don't know. Should I, I, I try to contact him on the radio? Yes, I think... Wait a minute. What is it? Listen, the chloro's coming. Good Lord! He's sure to miss Mullen. Yeah, wait. Polly, get your brother's body on the cot. Put a blanket over it. Pretend it's Mullen asleep. Polly, for heaven's sake. My brother. All right, you've got to do it, man. It's our only chance. Listen, if Mullen could go out there and Very risk well. his... Very well. I will do it. Earthman. Yes. You have jettisoned the body. Yes. Good. Is there something further we can do? No, I... We are very tired. Our grief is very great at losing one of our unit. We would like to rest alone. I will respect your wishes. I see that one of your units sleeps already. Yes, yes, Mr. Mullen was overcome with grief. I leave you. Oh, brother. Holy, I thought sure you were going to rush him. With that brave little guy out there. What do you think I am anyway? And to think I laughed at him makes me ashamed. Yeah, I guess... I guess I've been saying some things that maybe weren't too funny. I owe all of you an apology. <clears throat> you think it's safe to try the radio? Yeah, we better. Hello? Hello, Mullen. Can you hear me? Yes, I I hear you. Where are you? I'm standing on the outside of the ship. All right, now take care. One misstep and you'll be marooned in space. Now, can you find the steam tubes? I think I've found one of them already. I can feel the rim. I just hope it doesn't let go when I get inside. Be careful. I'm going into the tube now. I can feel the ladder rungs I use to repair the inside. Keep in contact. Good Lord. They've let go with a blast. Well, it may be the starboard tubes. Mullen, Mullen. Still here. They use the other tubes, fortunately. Now, if they don't try to correct for over-deflection... Yeah, keep moving. I seem to be... Wait. Yes, yeah, I'm at the end of the tube now, where it opens into the control room. Good, good. Now, look, there's a small metal door there. Can you feel it? Yes, I... It's locked from the other side. Oh. I can't budge it. Mullen. Mullen, listen to me. Stuart, I'm scared. I'm terribly scared. Yeah, all right, all right. Now, hang on. Don't blow up. Listen to me. Are you listening? Yes. Take the spare oxygen tank. Bang on the metal door that leads to the control room. The chloros are bound to hear you. When one of them comes to investigate, try to hit him with a cylinder. Now, aim for the stalk on top of his body. Try to blind him. When you do that... I... I'll try. Well, now, go on. Only one can come. The other will stay at the controls. Now, start banging. (coughs) 
Any luck? No, I... Wait, I... I hear something. Something's opening the lock. The door now. I hear... Ah! Mullen! Mullen, what happened? Mullen, can you hear me? Mullen! <laughs> Mullen. Mullen. Oh, it's no use. They must have gotten him. Yeah, he was one brave little guy, that one. But suppose they have just got him in the control room. I mean, maybe he's not dead. Well? Well, then maybe one of us could rush them. We could bang on the door and jump the chloro. Well, the first guy would be a cinch to die. Well, I... I would be willing to take the chance. You? Why not? I could try. Not you. I'm the strongest. I do it. Now, listen. Listen, you chaps. I'm an old man. I've got nothing to live for anyway. Suppose I throw myself at the ray gun. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Twenty minutes ago, there wasn't one of you who'd risk his little finger to get us out of here. Now you're falling all over each other. Maybe Mr. Mullen teaches us a lesson, huh? Yeah. Okay, Polly, give me the wrench. I'll start banging on the door. They say that selflessness is contagious. I guess maybe it is. I'd been a cynic all my life, a man who believed in nothing. Well, I'd come face to face with four human beings who proved that I'd been living a lie. I knew what I was going to do now. When the chloro came to investigate our compartment, I had it all planned. If only my poor, weak hands would hold out long enough. Ready? Ready. Ready. Here goes. That should bring him. Try again. Wait, wait, listen. Shh. It's at the door. Get ready. It's opening the lock. For poor old Mullen now. Uh, steady. No! Let him have it! Wait! Let Stop it! it. Uh, it's not the floor! Wait! Uh, good Lord! It's Mullen! Oh, it's Mullen. Get the helmet off! That's it! All right, the lift! Mullen! Mullen, are you all right? I, I seem to be quite all right. Well, the chloros. Both dead. At least I hope so. Well, what happened? Well, I banged on the steam tube hatch and a chloro opened it. Yeah? I hit him with a cylinder. It blinded him, I, I guess, but didn't kill him. He grabbed me and pulled me into the cabin. In the struggle, he broke my transmitter. That, that's why I couldn't talk to you. Finally, I managed to, to club him down. Well, what about the other one? The other one almost got me. It must have heard the scuffle and came into the cabin with a ray gun. What I did, I, I guess, was pure reflex. The cabin atmosphere was chlorine, of course, and the greenie didn't have a spacesuit on. Uh -huh. So I just turned on the oxygen valve in that spare tube. It was like spraying an insect with poison. Well, you're a brave man, Mullen. I'd have been scared to death. I... I... Mullen, what is it? Mullen. An hour later, false hands and all, I was at the controls of the ship, headed for Earth. We'd gotten rid of the chlorinating equipment and restored the oxygen naturally. Mullen was asleep in the cabin under a sedative. Or so I thought, until the cabin door opened. Mullen, for Pete's sake, get back to bed. No, I'm quite all right now, really. Do you mind if I watch how you operate the ship? No, no, not at all. Sit down. You know, I guess, uh... I owe you an apology. I didn't think too much of you. That's your privilege. <laughs> no, it isn't anybody's privilege, Mullen, to despise another... For years now, I've abandoned hope of finding any decency in human beings. I owe you a vote of thanks. You embarrass me, Mr. Stewart. I, I didn't do it for any heroic reasons, I assure you. Far from it. Well, why did you do it, Mullen? That puzzles me very much. Well, Mr. Stewart, I'm a bookkeeper. Seventeen years ago, I left Earth to work on Arcturus. I never made much impression on anybody on Earth, although I 
wanted very much to have people like me. Well, about a year ago, I started to write to my family again. Don't ask me why. And then I asked for a leave of absence to go home after 17 years. Well, I still don't understand. It wasn't patriotism or love of a woman or money or any of those things. What was it? Mr. Stewart, haven't you ever been homesick? You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features A Gun for Dinosaur by L. Sprague de Camp, a story of hunters in the bloodiest and most ferocious arena of all prehistoric Earth, where hunting reptile heavyweights is no job for human lightweights. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Sea Shoot, a story from the pages of Galaxy, written by Isaac Asimov and adapted for radio by George Leffers. Featured in the cast were Lyle Sudrow, Stan Early, Bob Hastings, Mercer McLeod, Danny Ocko, and John Gibson. Your announcer, Bill McCord. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Next week on a distant planet in a forgotten colony of Earth, a man is ordered to commit a murder. Listen to Skulking Permit on X-1 next week. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.